Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology, and I'm also with the Carleton University uh, Department of Geography and Environmental Studies. In this particular video, I'm walking along the, uh, the, the canal in Ottawa, the Rideau Canal, and of course it's solid ice, it's uh, mid-January, and there's lots of people whizzing by me on skates and so on. And I'm going to basically discuss the uh, carbon in the atmosphere and oceans, the sources and sinks, and also techniques called carbon dioxide removal that we better start doing pretty darn quick to get the CO2 levels down in the atmosphere. So think of the analogy of a uh, bathroom, you've got a bathtub full of water, that represents the oceans and water bodies on the planet. You have the door closed in the room, so the air inside the room is the atmosphere. You're in there, you represent the fauna on the planet, the animals that uh, breathe in the oxygen and uh, emit CO2 in their breasts through respiration. You have plants in the room. The soil in the plant pots represents the soil of the earth that stores a lot of carbon, also acts as a carbon sink or a source of carbon. Some of the soils in the some of the uh, soils in these plants is very cold and frozen, representing the permafrost in the Arctic region and Antarctica. And the plants themselves represent the flora which are the which are the uh, plant life in both the um, the plant life on, on earth which they of course consume co2 they extract the carbon and uh, they emit the oxygen as a result as they uh, grow so you've got this system this earth system so from our burning of fossil fuels we're uh, basically that's the oxidation of the carbon that's in the materials that we remove from deep in the earth. And we're raising the level of carbon in the atmosphere as a result. The combustion process produces the CO2, which then goes into the atmosphere. The CO2 levels have varied between 280 and, uh, between 180 and 280 parts per million over the last million years or so. Now we're pushing well over 400 parts per million and the rise, even though the International Energy Agency says that human emissions have somewhat stabilized in the last three or four years, we're still seeing record rises of CO2 in the atmosphere. So this year, the number pegged in at 2.77 parts per million rise of CO2, um, which is a bit surprising to me. I thought it was going to be well over three parts per million. In fact, uh, you know, from some months compared to months a year ago, or even some days compared to days a year ago, the levels are much higher than that, even uh, approaching, you know, 3.65 numbers like that, parts per million rise. But the average over the year, on a year to year basis, the official number is 2.77. The previous year, 2015, had a rise of 3.05 parts per million, which was a record. For the last decade or so, we've had frequent numbers of 2.5 parts per million rise. Decades before that were under two. Decades before that were closer to one. So the CO2 level in the atmosphere has been rapidly rising and there's an exchange, a dynamic balance between the CO2 in the atmosphere and that in the oceans. So if suddenly the, there's a, a sprinkler going off in your bathroom, which is simulating the rain. That will absorb some of the CO2 as the raindrops are falling, bringing that slightly acidified, carb weak carbonic acid into the bathtub, creating, making, the, making it more acidic, and that also affects the ability of the ocean to sustain life. It, uh, if the acidity drops too low, then the ocean loses the ability to uh, produce a lot of the phytoplankton that require calcium carbonate in their backbones and we run into big problems as a result. So 
We need to slash fossil fuel emissions. That's leg one of this proverbial or metaphorical bar stool that I talk about. We also have to um, deploy carbon dioxide removal technologies or negative emission technologies to lower CO2 levels in the atmosphere down to 350 parts per million or even below that. We also have to deploy solar radiation management techniques to cool the Arctic. That will be the SRM, solar radiation management, will be in another video. This video I'm talking mostly about carbon dioxide removal. So how do we increase the sinks through biomimicry, etc.? Okay, so the first thing is we have to, the gain of CO2 in the atmosphere is the sources minus the sinks. We're increasing the sources with our fossil fuel emissions burning and we have to stop that. We have to reduce the sources, but that's not sufficient in the climate system. We also have to Im increase the sinks. So we have to stop cutting down forests. We have to basically be much more savvy as a civilization in dealing with these carbon sinks. So for example, we need to enhance boreal forests. We need to protect uh, rainforests and increase the size of these uh, carbon sinks in the atmosphere. But there's other ways, other high-tech methods that we need to talk about to, and we need to deploy as quickly as possible. And this includes direct air capture. So there's about a dozen or so startup companies that are working on ways to directly remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, one of these companies, Carbon Engineering, for example, uses large fans to blow air through different chemical solutions, and the CO2 is trapped in these chemical solutions and then removed by chemical processes, effectively removing CO2 from the atmosphere. Of course, all these processes need their energy budget looks at, look energy budgets looked at how is the power provided to do this removal you know and the because the net carbon footprint if you like the net carbon effect has to be a removal not a an addition of co2 so these direct capture technologies are out there there's also um there's a there's some work that's been done. Lots of government money has gone to carbon capture and storage, CCS technologies, or carbon capture and sequestration. There's a huge Statoil project in Norway where CO2 is removed from the fossil, you know, through the in the fossil fuel extraction of oil, and it's pumped back down deep into the seafloor under the continental shelves off Norway. And the idea is to force this CO2 into the oil wells to increase the pressure to extract more oil, but also more importantly to sequester this or trap the CO2 back into the ground. And then you have to worry about how long will the CO2 be there? Will it leak out eventually? How much does it cost per ton of CO2? And the costs are enormous and these technologies um, billions of dollars have been spent on these technologies and basically most people uh, that analyze the effects say it's pretty much a waste of time and money because you simply can't capture enough to make a difference. But this is, uh, this is why you know, government shouldn't really throw piles of money on, into things that lobbyists say uh, this, this is a good technique to do. This has happened, the fossil fuel industry has tried to keep their industry going by this carbon capture and sequestration method. Other methods that are much better are things like, um, for example, there's vast areas of the ocean that are basically devoid in, um, there's vast areas of the ocean that are basically devoid in phytoplankton. The reason being that the ocean stratified and layered and as a result it's not getting upwelling and it's not getting the nutrients coming to the surface. So you have the sunlight, you have the water, you have the, the uh, CO2 
but you don't have the nutrients, so you don't get phytoplankton growth. So uh, one idea is to put, seed the oceans with iron, and that will stimulate phytoplankton growth. But the problem is, you know, there's a lot of energy going into grinding up the iron. You have to use large quantities of it. The effect is not long lasting, etc. So one, another very interesting idea is to use um, these buoyant rice husks, if you like, lace them with nutrients, and these things will float around on the ocean and slowly release nutrients, stimulating phytoplankton growth, which will then stimulate growth up the food chain. And all of this growth of plants will then attract animals, etc. And there's a lot of carbon stored. Remember, we've got rid of about 90% of the large fish in the oceans, and there's lots of carbon that would be stored in their bodies if those fish were still in the ocean. We, so by reducing the biomass on the surface of the earth in the last uh, few centuries by a factor of about two or more, then this represents a storage of carbon that we no longer have. So if we can stimulate life in the oceans, both plants and animals, then we can get significant carbon storage. So this is another idea of uh, ways to store carbon. Of course, a lot of the vegetation on the planet, the sinks are declining. So as the health of boreal forests decreases through drought, causing uh, trees to die, to be stressed, to be affected more by pests uh, like emerald ash borer, pine beetle, etc. You know, there's more and more, as the trees get weaker and weaker, there's more and more fires and that decreases the sink and increases, you know, becomes a large source of CO2 to the atmosphere. Soils store a tremendous amount of carbon. So there's um, various techniques using a material called biochar. So if you take organic matter and you pyrolyze it, so you raise it to high temperatures in the absence of oxygen, it doesn't oxidize to produce CO2. It uh, forms a very hard uh, charcoal-like material, biochar, which you can then put in the soils, mix it up in the soils, and it increases the fertility of soils, and that carbon stays in the soils for a long period of time. So biochar is a very promising uh, carbon storage technique. So there's lots of different ideas to ways to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, another very interesting technique is to use, um, for example, long cylindrical pipes that are several hundred meters long, maybe a meter or larger in diameter, suspended from buoys so that they're sitting under the surface of the ocean by five or 10 meters or something. And the bot at the bottom end of this open pipe, there's a one-way valve. The idea, this whole pipe is suspended by buoys or rafts, which move up and down with the waves. So if the waves are say three meter high waves from crest to trough, then what will happen is that as the wave rises, it will lift up the whole cylinder um, and uh, as the wave crest passes, it will drop the whole cylinder. So the motion, vertical motion will be about three meters. So you have a one-way valve at the bottom and as the, the cylinder is lifted upward, the valve closes, a plug of water is raised upward in the pipe as the wave passes and the whole apparatus sinks lower. The one-way valve opens and it traps more water from slightly deeper and so basically you get a vertical pumping of the water driven by wave action. That water that's 200 meters down or so um, is below the thermocline, so is loaded with nutrients. The water near the surface is devoid of nutrients, so phytoplankton growth is not very large. So simply by the passage of waves, you can bring up uh, nutrients to the surface. There's a company called Atmotion, um, which has been working on this technology. So in conclusion,